so far we were doing discriminative models. Somebody would give us speech and the task was turning that speech into transcription, transcribe your audio. We saw only one example for generative type of models, generating speech or speech synthesis. This is another one. Previously, we were using a Gaussian mixture model when we were working with uh, GRUs, gated recurrent units. The idea here is, can you actually treat wave in a discrete fashion and use softmax? That's the big idea. This is your wave for each time step, like the time step here, you have a continuous variable. And that's why people said maybe a Gaussian mixture model is a good model for this. Can we actually treat this continuous signal as discrete and use softmax? That's your waveform. And your task is generative. Given the history, generate the next. This one we are going to model by a stack of convolutional layers. XT is a sample from your audio. And we want to put a categorical distribution over the next value. You cannot use any type of convolution because this is a predict next word, predict next uh, sample. We're going to use causal convolution, which is not going to look into the future. It's always going to look into the past. And this is going to have a receptive field of five. Why? Because one, two, three, four, five samples in your input are impacting your output. And where is this form five coming from? You have one, two, three, four layers. Your filter size is two. For each one of these guys, your filter size is two. And that's how you're going to get five. Is there a way to look far into the past? Is there a way to increase the receptive field? And for those of you who took part one, you know that for uh, semantic segmentation, we were using a technique called dilated convolutions or atrus convolution. Atrus is a French word for hole, so convolutions with holes. And that trick was enabling us increase the receptive field. The idea of a dilated convolution is very simple. What are we going to do? You're going to say for the first layer, I'm going to use a dilation of one. So this first layer is going to be basically what you are doing up there. But for the next layer, you're increasing the dilation to be two. It means that you're skipping one of these hidden layers, hidden entries. So you're skipping this, and that's going to give you your convolution. For dilation of four, you're going to skip three of these guys. So it's always dilation minus one. And the last guy is dilation eight. So you're skipping seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven outputs. And this way, you're increasing the receptive field. And what did you gain? you still have the same number of parameters. You just need to count these arrows and they're going to be the same as what you have up there. So it's the same arrows, the same number of arrows. And these arrows are going to correspond to, to your weights. Okay, this way you're going to look at more entries in your signal. And then you're going to keep repeating that. You do one, two, four, eight, up until five, 12 for your layers. And then the next layer, the next set of layers, are going to start from 1, 2, 4, up until 5, 12. And then you keep repeating that for how many layers that you have. Another major con contribution is turning these uh, continuous variables into discrete. One option is to look at 16-bit integers per each time step and represent them with 16-bit integers. In that case, you are going to be able to model the probabilities for 2 to the power 16, which is 65,000. And if you put a softmax on it, it's going to be super slow. That's a lot of numbers. Another option is this mu law compounding. Compounding stands for compressing and expanding. But I guess we saw a similar formula when we were doing, uh, when we we're converting frequency to Mellis scale. You have this log term, you were dividing by some coefficient and multiplying by some coefficient. A similar thing is happening here. Okay, you're going to do mu law compounding. Basically, you're changing your scale. And then uh, your signal, let's assume that you already normalized it so that these values are from negative one to one, which is your mu to be 255. And then you're going to quantize in that space. Here, you are quantizing in the real space. Here, you are kind of quantizing in this modified space. And that's going to give you 256 possible values. And this is much better 
than 65,000. And uh, we were using convolutions for text and we were using gated activation unit. So it's the same activation as before, 10H times a gate. And whenever you have a gate, you have a sigmoid. That's the same. You have K is your layer index and F stands for filter, G stands for gate. You can add residual and skip connections. And remember the task here is given the history, predict the next uh, sample. You take your input, you push it through some causal com convolutions, you push them through some dilated convolutions, and then you keep repeating, these are your layers. And you're gonna have K layers. Each layer, you keep the output after the one by one convolution. You add them up, you push them through a ReLU, one by one convolution, ReLU, one by one convolution, softmax, because now you can do softmax and then you're gonna output. I think uh, I'm gonna stop here and cover the next, the rest of the paper next session. Any questions? When you said that 256 possible values is better, does that just, uh, that's just because we have um, a smaller model, like it, it requires less memory for the 256, or I guess less computation than the 65,000? Yes, if you remember softmax, you need to divide by the summation of these values. Oh, yeah. So each output is going to look at all of these 65,000. So it's going to be computationally more expensive. That makes sense. And doing a for loop only on 256. And the other question I was thinking about is if it made sense, um, it seems like they're predicting each signal value, like one by one, for this like super high frequency signal if it's like a sampling rate of 80,000 or whatever that is and is there anybody who tries predicting chunks at a time like the next the next millisecond which would still be like a couple hundred samples and instead of doing x per um sample do it uh like windows of samples at a time yes you can absolutely do it but then the argument against it is the convolution is already doing the chunking for you hmm. Okay, it's gonna take two samples, turn them into a single one. Yeah. Then it's gonna take these two samples, turn it into a single one. So at this point, you're looking at four samples and that could be a chunk of your audio. Yeah. And convolutions are cheap because these weights are shared. It's the same mm -hmm. parameters. And is there a way to do this efficiently? It seems like you'd run into problems where you, you need like the first, you need the first 2000 time steps to start doing prediction on the 2001st. Um, would that slow it down or are there ways to make this more parallelizable? Actually convolutions are parallel. So you take your entire input and then you compute the next layer in parallel. That's true. You could already batch this, yeah. Yeah, it's not batch. It's uh, gonna do it in parallel because it's efficient to do it. Yeah. The operation of this guy, doesn't depend on the operations that this other guy is doing. Yeah. So you can just parallelize them. When you go deep, it's not parallel. The depth is gonna be sequential. Yeah. But these these are gonna get computed in parallel. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah, sure.